Welcome. We are honored to have you listen and participate in these dialogues produced by the Cora de Brazza Foundation. To learn more about the foundation and about how you can help us in our mission of unearthing untold stories of moral energy, visit virtuesofpeace.com. There, you can access show archives, show resources, visit our Etsy shop, and support us with a donation. Virtuesofpeace.com. Hello and welcome to Virtues of Peace. My name is Hope Elizabeth May and I'm joined by Michael Buzzy, Randy Olson, and special guest newcomer Riley Olson. No relation to Randy Olson, um, but Riley, uh, well, welcome and we're so honored to have you participate in this discussion about Bertha von Suttner's most famous novel, Lay Down Your Arms. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah. And it was really, you know, I know that you read this book and we briefly talked about it and it was like, hey, we should do a podcast about this because we haven't done a podcast about Lay Down Your Arms. And that's really, really important because this is the book for which Bertha von Suttner is most known. And what we're going to do in this show is just focus on the first three chapters. This book is 435 pages long, and the first three chapters take up about 58 or so pages. So that's all we're doing today, um, talking about the first three chapters and the preface. Before we do that, um, I want to divert the listener's attention to the show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com. And you can find a PDF of Lay Down Your Arms. But what's also extremely useful is this very short article from 1906 that Bertha wrote. It's called How I Wrote Lay Down Your Arms. And in that, she discusses the process of how she came to write it, uh, the difficulty she had in publishing it. And at several times in this article, she says that, look, this book, writing this book, made her become a peace activist. This is something that we've talked about on the show before. And so just very briefly, uh, Bertha had been writing and publishing before she wrote Lay Down Your Arms. And the, the book that she published right before Lay Down Your Arms is called Das Maschinen Zeitalter, which means the machine age. And she published that originally under a pseudonym, Yamand, which just means someone, um, because she knew that if she published it under her name, uh, a, a a female name, philosophers and scientists would not read it. And it really is a work of philosophy. And we at the Bertha von Suttner Project have translated that into English and we will be bringing it to press in the next year or so. It's a really awesome book. So Bertha had already been an author and she learned about the peace through law movement in midlife. And as she says in this, this 1906 piece that's on our show resources page, she was just sort of blown away that there was an organized peace movement and she felt that she had to do something for the movement. And what can she do? She can write. And so she decided to write this book, Lay Down Your Arms. And this book, just it just led to all sorts of experiences and encounters and as she explains in the 1906 article, um, it really caused her to organize and to create the Austrian Peace Society, which she presided over. She was the founder and president of the Austrian Peace Society. So you can see that she writes this work of historical fiction, and then it, it, it like makes her into an organizer. And she's going to these conferences and she's discussing things with diplomats and foreign ministers and so forth. 
So this is how, this is the book that begins that organizational process. And again, I highly recommend this short piece on our show resources page, how I wrote, lay down your arms. Um, so the book, lay down your arms, the German is Die Waffen Nieder, and there's a subtitle and it's lay down your arms, the autobiography of Martha von Tilling. And that's really important. This book is an autobiography of this fictitious person named Martha von Tilling. And before we get into it, this book, this was translated into English for the first time in 1892. So it was originally published in German in 1889, translated into English in 1892 by Timothy Holmes. And that is a, such a fascinating story. The translator himself is a surgeon. He was the editor of Gray's Anatomy. Um, and so this is, and he was part of the London International Arbitration Association. And that entity, the London International Arbitration Association is extremely important in the uh, sort of awakening of Bertha to the organized peace movement. She sort of learns about that group and she gets a pamphlet from them. And, and anyway, Timothy Holmes is like on, I think he's like a vice president of this arbitration association. He is the one who translates this from German into English, the story in itself um, on our show resources page we do link to the Wikipedia page, but it's amazing because nothing on his Wikipedia page says anything about him translating lay down your arms. It's all about like him as a surgeon doing Gray's anatomy and so forth. So again, this is like fragmentation, um, these silos that exist, and uh, perhaps one of us can update that Wikipedia page. But I know, Riley, that you were sort of, yeah, greatly impacted by some of the sentences in the preface to the second English edition, which is published in 1894. And I was just wondering if you wanna share some of those passages and, and discuss them a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this particular quote from it, which I think is really important to keep in mind, um, like the whole time reading through this book. So, um, Timothy Holmes says, it is hoped also that the enlarged circulation of a work so graphic and written by one who has so thoroughly studied the real aspects of war as seen by those on the spot may lead not so much to sentimental emotions and vague protests as to a business-like discussion of the means by which the resort to war may be at any rate rendered more and more infrequent. Um, and I find that incredibly important the particularly um, that he wants it to lead to a business-like discussion because it's easy to say, oh, war is bad and we all wish that it couldn't happen anymore. But the point of this book being, how do we engage in a conversation that will actually lead to war becoming less infrequent? Like how do we get into that and actually look at it instead of just having these vague protests and like explosions of emotion. Yeah. And um, on this show, and actually I think we have a couple of shows from like a year ago, one of the watchwords or catchphrases of this movement was organize the world. And so this business-like discussion is about like getting organized and building, uh, we've used this phrase numerous times on this show, um, one, a normative framework. <laughs> so like the actual principles such as the minimization of suffering, um, you don't fire on non-combatants, these are the you know, Geneva Conventions. And then of course, you know, you have the stuff on paper and then you have to implement it and bring it to life and create structures and we living in 2021 are in the midst of that process, right? So this business-like discussion, like when we talk about peace, right? It's not just like, yeah, these emotions and so forth. 
there's real work in organizing and clarifying norms, implementing them. One of the things that I, I sort of harp on when I'm teaching is, you know, this, this fact that the very first prosecution of the International Criminal Court, which was in 2011, was the pro a prosecution for the war crime of conscripting and enlisting child soldiers. Now that's 2011, and it was from Radhika Kumaraswamy, who was like a special rapporteur on child soldiers at the UN. She's an amazing international lawyer. She was the one who I remember her giving a talk and she said, look, the reason why it took so long to prosecute someone for conscripting and enlisting um, a child soldier is because we didn't have the normative framework to do it. That, that's where I learned that phrase. And I was just like, wow. So yeah, the business-like discussion, um, it's about organizing, clarifying, implementing, and then of course, teaching because we're not born with innate knowledge of, of this stuff. I'll stop and see if anybody else wants to. Um, I, had, I had something else I wanted to add just about the very last phrase, um, because a lot of times peace activists or the call for peace is um, viewed as something idealistic and unattainable. But this last phrase saying the resort to war may be at any rate rendered more and more infrequent. I think that's really important because it may not be something we notice in our lifetimes even, but it's just setting the groundwork now so that even the goal is even just to make it less frequent. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, I'll jump in there. Uh, <clears throat> I, you know, there's something we've talked about last year quite a lot that you know, there was this definition of peace from Jane Addams, uh, you know, peace being the unfoldment of worldwide processes that nourish human life or nurture human life, nourish, yeah, nourish. So it's like, like, it's a different definition than just not war. And I can't stress that enough because, you know, when we're talking about organizing the world and if we're talking about peace, like the idea is building systems that make life better and not just preventing the annihilation of life. It's like, it's, it's more than just not war. And yeah, I, I know I've said it before, but it's worth saying again. Um, and I, before we get into the book, I just want to go through a quick, um, like a quick framing of Bertha von Sutner's life as to like, okay, who's this woman? And like, what is she writing this book about? And like, what's going on? Um, so just real quick, I mean, she's born in 1843 in Prague into aristocracy, right? And I'm gonna fast forward from there 30 years because nothing exciting happens until you're 30 anyway. <laughs> so she, she gets this letter in 1876 or she, she sees this thing in the newspaper and she like, uh, like uh, applies essentially to go work as a secretary for Alfred Nobel in Paris. And she gets the job, which is super cool. And I think that that's like one of these major turning points where this person goes from, you know, a countess to, you know, this is like this pivot into this new stage of life. And so she she's she's working as a secretary to alfred nobel and we all know alfred nobel leads a tremendous life and so there's like this relationship to greatness early on she comes and gets married in secret to this cool dude named arthur which i, I know eventually we're going to talk more about but um her and arthur run away to georgia as like their marriage they elope and it's there that she does most of her writing Right. So she writes Inventory of the Soul in 1883. And just to give you the, the image, right, like her, like neither family really was terribly happy about this marriage. So they don't have any money. Right. And so her and Arthur are like teaching language and music to children as like a way to get by. And like, yeah, they're doing little bits of writing and that just like generally speaking, imagine the shift, right, of a person who's like, 
going and born into money and then gets kicked out basically and has to do different kinds of things for money. It's a, it's a world that we can all kind of sympathize with. It's a lifestyle anyway. So it isn't until 1885 that she even learns about the peace movement. Like this like doesn't even exist in her frame of reference until 1885. And I know Hope at the beginning kind of laid out that she wrote Lay Down Your Arms in 1889 and it's not published in English for two, three more years. But it's like, like she discovers peace movement and then immediately starts working on something in order to contribute. I just, I think that that's a relevant detail. And by the time she publishes the book, they like, she's made the rounds enough so that she knows who to talk to and knows how to become part of the scene. And she starts living this like very different kind of life because for whatever reason, something about her personality has put her in a leadership position of the peace movement. Now, what does that mean? It's like, when you think about a leader in a peace movement, what are they doing? Well, they're like, they're like creating organizations all around the world locally because this is before computers, right? There's no Facebook group. It's like you got to go somewhere and get people to organize. So she's one of these people who's going around and creating organizations and participating and attending these meetings. She's writing all the time. Books, yes. Also like journals, like peace uh, peace journals, arbitration journals, stuff like that. And the main thing that I'm going to go into, well, I'm just going to mention it. It's really worth looking into the Tsar's Manifesto, which is like one of the main things that leads into the 1899 Hague Peace Conference. Like her and her husband actively pushed for that for like a few years. It was a constant, like, arranging public meetings, lectures, you name it. Like, get the czar to invite the world to have a peace. Like, sit down and talk about peace at the table. Like, make it happen. We've already talked a lot of times about what the 1899 Hague Peace Conference is. And she is a huge contributing factor to that moment. So, after 1899, just, you know, she's going around the world doing these lecture tours, continuing to write, continuing to do this leadership, this, this organization. And, you know, you can picture it. You can see this is, you know, going around on boats and carriages, <laughs> like organizing people around the world. Because, again, before planes, before, you know, mass automobiles, it's really important to think about that. So after that, though, it's like trying to create a public awareness about the permanent court of arbitration. We've talked about it already, but very important thing worth looking up. Permanent court of arbitration. What is that about? What does it mean? Definitely worth thinking about. Important con uh, contextual component here. She wins the Nobel Peace Prize in 1905. And her connection to Alfred Nobel is largely the reason why that prize even exists. It's a whole story. And she continues doing these lecture tours and she does like one big one in 1912. And she, in 1912, she writes her last book, The Barbarization of the Sky, which we've talked about a lot as well. And then she finally passes away about, what is it, about a week before the assassination of the Archduke and the beginning of World War I, like literally a week. So, you know, this herald, this like beacon of the peace movement gets, you know, she passes away and then immediately the world is plunged into the, you know, the great war. So like, that's the like fast version about her life and who she was. And hopefully, a, you know, not too, uh, hopefully it wasn't minimized to the point of being uh, useless, but it's like, this is a cool lady. <laughs> Indeed, cool yeah. lady. No, it's a, re a really beautiful description, and I, 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 I very much appreciate you pointing out this connection between her and the eighteen ninety nine Hague Peace Conference. And again, that that sort of underscores the stuff that I was talking about in the beginning, where in this nineteen oh six article, she's like, "Look, I wrote this book in eighteen eighty nine, and then I like." 
organized this Austrian Peace Society. And of course, 10 years later is 1899. So she's doing all of this groundwork, um, right? This organization as you're talking about. And in addition to like, there not being Facebook groups and like carriages and boats, I think also like the electric light was not so much a popular thing at the time. Um, so I think like candlelight and so forth is what's going on. But um, but in any case, yeah, she's doing all of this work. And so when the 1899 Hague Peace Conference comes and she sees that Tsar's manifesto and it's like, and, and there's articles about how he, the Tsar Nicholas II of Russia had read Lay Down Your Arms and he had also had read some Jan Bloch the future of war. And he had read these two things and this inspired him. And so there's there are other narratives of why the czar calls this peace conference, like they couldn't afford to keep up with the military arms race, what have you. But importantly, she is the only woman, like, and she has to be there at the 1899 Hay Peace Conference. And she's the only woman that's even in the room when they open up the proceedings. And she writes a diary that, um, we did translate into English at the Birth of Unsutner project, and we will be publishing that eventually. But um, yeah, so, so important, her to the 1899 Hague Peace Conference. And as you know, Randy, that permanent court of arbitration still exists. It's a pre-World War I international organization that still exists. So yeah, th thank you for that, that summary of Bertha. Um, and so anybody else before we go into like the book and the characters and, and anything about the, the preface that anybody wants to add before we go into the characters? Michael, go ahead. Sure, thank you. Just to kind of connect Riley's reading of the preface with Andy's great description, with Randy's great description of Bertha's life and activism and her general importance is that when the preface discusses this business-like discussion and these means by which the resort to war may be at any rate rendered more and more infrequent, it, in Randy's description, you can see that is what Bertha does. She's not, in a sense, she's networking, she's organizing, she's traveling around the world to inculcate these ideals of peace and, you know, and organizing the world for these creation of international bodies that can then foster this environment it's totally what she's doing and with any great activist throughout history that is a similar model that they follow whether it is for the effort of peace or for civil rights or what have you that you can just totally see it in her in her own endeavors and i think that is an important connection to make as well yes thank you for that so yes and you know <laughs> As we all know, we keep talking about Bertha because like a lot of people, like especially in the United States, she's really unknown and she's just so important to the, the organizing of the world that we have inherited and we're continuing to do that. So, all right, um, the autobiography of Martha von Tilling. So you have the main characters are, of course, Martha. And her maiden name, if you will, is Offhouse or Authis. Um, so she becomes Martha von Tilling. Um, but, you know, she's born Martha Althaus. Her father is a general, General Althaus, and he's going to be an important character in the novel, Martha's father. Um, Count Arno Dotsky uh, will be Martha's first husband. They have a child. Uh, named Rudolf Dotsky. Um, I'll just say that, you know, Count Arno Dotsky is going to be killed. This Most people who know Lay Down Your Arms know that this is a very sad book where Martha loses um, two husbands. And so Count Arno Dotsky, her first husband, does die. She then meets a Colonel Frederick von Tilling. And so there you get, okay, this is where we're going to get Martha von Tilling. So she will marry Colonel Frederick von Tilling. And also important is her friend, Lori Greisbach, um, who's a childhood friend of Martha's. 
And so in the first three chapters, it's really, you know, Martha and Dotsky and Frederick von Tilling and, and Martha's father that are going to be, I think, the most important characters. So that's a summary of the characters. What's very nice about Lay Down Your Arms is that each chapter has a kind of, you know, like subheadings for the various themes that are discussed in the chapter. And so chapter one, the, sub, the subheadings that you'll see, and again, you can download the PDF at virtuesofpeace.com. Girlish days, my first marriage and birth of my first child, and my husband summoned to the Italian War of 1859. So this is just, these are the subheadings under chapter one. And the very first sentence of the book, I will begin with, because I think there's a lot in the first sentence, uh, begins, at 17, I was a thoroughly overwrought creature. This perhaps I should no longer be aware of today if it were not that my diaries have been preserved. I, I just, wow. So she begins this, she's reflecting, okay? I, and I think she's like in maybe 40 years old or something like this when she's writing this book, but she's reflecting on her diaries. That's what this book is. And she begins the very first sentence, the very first page, the very first chapter with, okay, when I was 17, I was a thoroughly overwrought creature. And I wouldn't be aware of this if I didn't have my diaries. Now, this really struck me because in Bertha's memoirs, and, and I've talked about this passage repeatedly, and I've talked about this phrase repeatedly, this phrase, the red thread. In her memoirs, she says something like, um, because I kept diaries, I, was, I became aware of a red thread of the peace movement, that it's not just like these disparate events and personalities and so forth. There is like continuous line of effort. And if I didn't keep my diaries, she says this in her memoirs, if I didn't keep my diaries, I wouldn't be aware of that. And before, she goes on to say, before I kept my diaries, it was like politics was all of these like random, like random events. But because I started keeping a diary, I could see this continuous line of effort. And so this very first sentence of lay down your arms, it's like, she's able to see her own development and evolution through the book. And this idea of development and evolution is absolutely a leitmotif, a trope, a theme of this book and of Bertha's philosophy, quite frankly, that humanity is evolving. And that in this book, you see her personality evolving. Um, and so the very first sentence is sort of marking that, okay, at 17, I'm immature, I'm emotional, I'm, I'm sort of like ignorant and, and childish. And so, um, yeah, I, I think I, I've, I've said my piece about that, but the, the diaries that she's reflecting on it become extremely important to the narrative of the book. Um, and so she keeps them in, she refers to them as her red volumes. She takes kind of these red diaries that she's reflecting on and then writing this book when she's in her, I think, in her 40s or so. And so, Riley, I know that also you had some passages in this chapter one that you wanted to talk about. So over to you. Yeah, so... Um... Going back to what you said about the the very first phrase in like the heading for this chapter is girlish days. Um, and like you said, the red thread of the peace movement, she's kind of tracking this these childish thoughts and growing up throughout the book and in, like intellectually. Um, and so it starts with her um, she describes like as a child she had all of these like grandiose ideas about war and like the honor in it and that 
those kinds of ideas are represented a lot by her father and her first husband, Arno, um, because you know her father is a retired soldier and he served under a General Radetsky who he constantly refers to and is you know, telling all these stories of back in his glory days and is very excited for Arno, Martha's first husband, because he's gonna get to go out to fight this new war and he's gonna get a chance at glory. Um, and so there's this quote from the first chapter. Um, it says, my father also was all on fire for the war to conquer the Piedemontes would be only child's play. And in support of this assertion, the Radetsky anecdotes were poured out again. I heard the impending campaign talked about always from the strategic point of view, a balancing of the chances on the two sides, how and where the enemy would be routed, and the advantages which would thereby accrue to us. The humane point of view is that whether lost or won, every battle demands innumerable sacrifices of blood and tears was quite left out of sight. Um, and so this is a feeling, she, start, she starts to notice this in the first chapter, um, and she hasn't quite developed any thoughts of that, but she's just recognizing that the pain and sorrow and violence and suffering that comes out of the war is not thought of, and no one talks about it. Um, yeah, does anyone have anything they'd like to say on chapter one, anything about this quote? Okay. If not, then there's not much else to say with that. It kind of develops as we go on um, into chapter two which um, the subheading for that is period of war, a wife's anxieties, terrible news. And in my version, which is actually different, um, another part of the subheading is maturing sentiments, which I think is really important. And Hope, is there anything you wanted to say about that? No, I mean, um, just, I'll just go back to the, the um, <clears throat> passage that you just read the humane point of view was quite left out of sight. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, there's so much going on here. And there's, <clears throat> again, I, I'll just repeat it. I think it needs to be repeated. As you said, there's like this, this intellectual development and there's an, an evolution of perception. And there's a sort of like, way of looking at war that that um, associates it with like positive attributes solely. And there's this other point of view that's totally, yeah, it's not even considered. And what you're going to see is, yeah, her coming to that view and then like the book, Lay Down Your Arms, you know, is that view. It's like, here's a different perspective on this institution. And in, in the short article that I mentioned earlier, the 1906, which you can download at our show resources page, how I wrote Lay Down Your Arms, um, she could not get this published because this like new point of view, if you will, was offensive. I'm, I'm looking at the article now. Quote, this does not interest our public, unquote, or quote, it would offend many of our readers, unquote, or quote, it is impossible to publish this in the present military state of affairs. They wanted her to change the title because, and I quote, it was too aggressive. <laughs> So, yes, I think that this like evolution of perception and this like totally different way of looking at war, you see it, you that passage that you just read is getting to that and maturing sentiments, right? Again, there's just like, there's a sort of waking up to reality here that she's going to take us through. So I'd like to kind of I'll just flesh that out using a quote from the book. I mean, because you, you get a you get a pretty good sense of it. On, it's on page four. She, she writes, 
the child must be aroused for this, its first duty as a citizen. His spirit must be hardened against the natural horror which the terrors of war might awaken by passing over as quickly as possible the story of the most fearful massacres and butcheries as of something quite common and necessary, and laying, meanwhile, all possible stress on the ideal side of this ancient national custom. And in this way, they have succeeded in forming a race eager for battle and delighting in war. So, like, that's, that's like, the, the frame of reference that we're, where we, where the, like, the book kind of begins the, the, the narrative about war. It's like, okay, that's where we're starting. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. I have one too. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, another one that I thought really helps to spell this out on the page before Randy. And she's writing and she says, quote, can there be a more glorious death than that on the field of honor? A nobler immortality than that of the hero, question mark? Hero meaning that of the soldier. And it really just helps to frame where Bertha's character is in the first chapter. And she even goes on to write in the first chapter that being killed in this way or serving in armed conflict is kind of this highest state of being for a human, for a person, which I find very interesting to contrast with Aristotelian philosophy when he writes that, you know, you, you reach your highest state of being or that which is closest to the gods by engaging in reason. And it's like reason is hijacked by a system priming individuals towards war and then replacing it in this like subterfuge sort of way with this violent thing that in a and falsely makes you believe that only through this can you attain your highest self, which is where all the honor and glory comes in as well. So very deep and very profound. Yeah, right on. And um, as I said before, the book that she writes before this book is Das Maschinen Zeitalter. And like there, you really like what that book is doing is she is writing from some point in the future. She doesn't tell us what year. And, and the, the narrator is reflecting on 1885 to 1886, various aspects of society. And yes, the sort of like humanity is, is in its infancy in these years. And we in the future have evolved to be actually rational where there's actually crimes against truth and there, there's a whole different language and framework that's going on and so I think that that sort of that philosophical framework that she had perfected in that book before she wrote this book lay down your arms is absolutely coming through um yeah the, this novel so so yeah I think we got chapter one um, and chapter two. Uh, Riley, did you want to read any any sections from chapter two? Yes, I did. I have a couple here, but the first one, um, just to set it up, thank you guys for, you know, going through chapter one again with, you know, the setup there. And as Martha continues to hear about the war that's about to happen or starting now, um, she starts to have more feelings and keeps thinking more about the humane point of view and begins to like, um, kind of look down on herself for that. So she goes into reading history books to learn more about the war and more about just war in general. And so this is on page 24. She says, in all the battle stories of history, I had found that the sympathy and admiration of the relators were always expressed for the party who wanted to free themselves from a foreign yoke and who fought for freedom. It is true that I was not capable of giving any distinct idea to the meaning of the word yoke or that of freedom, though so abundantly sung about. But one thing seemed to me perfectly clear, viz. that the shaking off the yoke and the struggle for freedom 
lay this time on the side not of Austria, but of Italy. But even for these scruples, timidly conceived as they were, and still more timidly expressed, I was thundered down. For here I was so unlucky as again to trench on a sacred principle, namely that our government, i.e. the government under which one happened to have been born, could never result in a yoke, but only in a blessing, that any who wished to tear themselves loose from us could not be the warriors of freedom, but only simple rebels, and that generally and in all circumstances, we were always and everywhere wholly in the right. Um, and this quote also shows this really important concept or that people of the time seem to have, and even now that in the glory of war, there's also always glory on our side. We are always right. And even though she's looking through history and finding that people who are fighting for freedom are down, it, down through posterity are like looked at as the ones in the right and they're the ones who are celebrated. And she's seeing that this war that's happening, um, Austria is trying to take land from Italy basically. And when she mentions that to people in her military circles, she's thundered down, you know, and she's wrong for even saying that, or wrong for even thinking that. Um, does anyone have anything on that kind of subject to add? Uh, just, I mean, I just want to point out that that sentiment, it hasn't changed all that much all the way to the present. The idea of national defense is is still sacred. The, uh, it's like the idea of national sovereignty is something that's still held to be a, like, you can't really object. If a nation wants to defend itself, then it can go to any means necessary. I think that's the, you know, that's the exact language that's often used. And so, so long as you frame it as, oh, the bad guys are trying to take something from us, then you can justify a stance of national defense and thereby, you know, have a have a recourse for war. Uh, and that's the, that's still what's going on. Like same same idea. Yeah, and, and I'll add um, one of our one of our friends and and allies in the spirit of history is Charles Sumner. And uh, in his The True Grandeur of Nations, he uses this phrase that disturbingly was used by Rudy Giuliani, <laughs> which is trial by battle. And uh, Charles Sumner gets at the idea that, look, you always like in, in a conflict, you're going to have two parties that both think that they're right. And like the quote unquote victor is the one who inflicts the most carnage. And so it's not any kind of rational resolution of the conflict. And this is a barbaric way of going about solving conflict. Um, the other thing I want to point out is, Riley, you said like in your edition. So again, like the subheadings for this chapter two is peri period of war, a wife's anxieties, terrible news and maturing sentiments. So we said before, like chapter one, my husband summoned. So Arno is summoned to war and a wife's anxieties follow with terrible news and maturing sentiments. And as you pointed out, Riley, she's, you know, reading history. And this is something that um, we see happening in actuality. Uh, I've, I think, mentioned her before, Vera Britton, who wrote a book called Testament of Youth. Um, she was one of the first women, I think it was Cambridge, that got into Cambridge. And um, like her brother, um, her fiance, and then a friend that they always palled around with all went to World War I and they all died. And her, mis her sentiments, quote unquote, matured because she was like, what the F? And what is this institution? And she started to read history um, and became involved with the League of Nations and so forth. But I think that 
yeah, there's this interesting dynamic going on where like the husband is called away and there's this like anxiety and pain and I like, we need to turn to something. And we've also seen it with, you know, Evelyn Grubb. We've talked about Evelyn Grubb on the show and how she turns to read the Geneva Conventions as a way of processing uh, this very like difficult reality. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just wanted to make that point as well that this like this reading of history is yeah part of the process of this evolution of sentiment and and intellect and the this logic there's like this illogic of war right so the maturing sentiments is also realizing that you know you can't have both parties in a conflict they can't they can't both be right it's like logically impossible and that's also part of um mat a maturing intellect period goodbye yeah that's exactly right and um randy too what you said earlier you're completely right that you know these thoughts and ideas are still around they haven't gone away um but i would like to move a little bit on in this chapter, um, you know, connecting these idealistic thoughts about it, you know, in the history she's studying, she still finds the sort of strategic point of view or idealistic point of view discussed and not anything like of individual's experience or about those who are at home and not fighting in the war, but have family members fighting in the war. Um, and she's been, at this point in the book, she's been kind of obsessively reading the list of the killed in the news, hoping not to find her husband's name. And this quote is from page 30 to 31. The list of the killed had already brought the names of several officers whom I had known personally. Among others, that of the son, her only one, of an old lady for whom I had conceived a great feeling of respect. That day, I determined to visit the poor lady. It was, for me, a painful, heavy journey. I could certainly give her no consolation, but could only weep with her. But it was the duty of affection, and so I set out. Um, and just pause there for a moment. That's something that's really important, um, because what, what can she do? to help those going through this. She doesn't have anything to give her, but just to sit with her and weep with her. And that's something that's really important that that's what you can give to people is just being there and feeling with them. But continuing on, she knocks on the door and a neighbor sticks his head out and says, it's no good ringing this, the dwelling is empty. What, has Frau von Ullmann gone? She was taken to a lunatic asylum three days since, and the head disappeared again as the door shut. I remained for a minute or two motionless, rooted to the spot, and the scenes which must have been going on here passed before my eyes. To what a height must the poor lady's sufferings have risen before her agony broke out in madness? And there is my father, wishing that the war might last 30 years for the welfare of the country. How many more such mothers in the country would have been driven to desperation? Um, just here we have again the juxtaposition between the sort of strategic point of view that her father represents and has and the humane point of view that she is starting to wake up to and is starting to, you know, be brought to the forefront of her attention here. And just like the empathy that becomes so important. Hope, did you have something you wanted to add? <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean it's like the father um, my and there's my father wishing that the war might last 30 years for the welfare of the country and it's just like I just think annihilation here that like no other consideration like women going insane women going into lunatic asylums 
women, you know, not having any, you know, support system, that just doesn't matter, right? And so I think this is also about like the voiceless and like the annihilated. And this is, you know, what Bertha is doing is helping to articulate, right? That there's like this other element of the world that must be considered. And, uh, you know, tomorrow is POW MIA recognition day, and I can't help but, you know, think of that history. And I know, Michael, you know it well, that it's like these women whose husbands were shot down over North Vietnam, and the United States government is not communicating to them at all about, you know, the status of their husbands and like they just couldn't take it anymore. And so they they organize and they start to agitate and demand that international law be complied with. And so I see like in this passage and throughout the book, there's just like this just it's, it's, it's like like women don't exist that it, like insane women. It's like it's not a big deal. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to add that. I'll be quiet now. I think the comparison to POW MIA Recognition Day is a fitting one for this pack passage in particular. And I can go back and say, I remember actually laughing out loud when I had sort of Bertha's awesome way of writing that, you know, here's this character who is just flagrantly disregarding the suffering of others due to this conflict and thinking that no it is a like this is a good thing it is allowing these individuals to achieve the highest state of being completely disregarding the impact it has on those who bear the brunt of the suffering you can really draw a comparison to what women were enduring during the vietnam war era here in america that in a sort of similar lesser state of being in that you exist in a society that is not allowing you to function as like a fully autonomous person over your family, that once your head of household, be it your husband, goes missing and you're not receiving any communication from the government on where they are, if they're a prisoner of war, if they've been missed, if they're missing in action, that your responsibility to then care for your family is brought to the forefront, but you don't have access to the necessary tools in society to do that. And so then to Hope's point, just continue disregard of those who are in a sense annihilated for this system that is for whatever reasons set in the time period, achieving glory to help meet the strategic needs of, you know, the United States to win the Cold War or whatever it may be for your given times historical circumstance that it just disregards the pain and the suffering that it in, it causes for the individuals who are there on the home front to bear the burden or on both sides or all sides involved in the conflict that the hurt and the suffering permeates and seeps into every facet of everyone who is being forced to reckon with the with the consequences of these armed conflicts and it's and in that that in and of itself is in a way a violation of your humanity and that for one, you're not being recognized as this fully autonomous being with stakes in a political society in the Bertha's character sense, or in even Evelyn Grubb's sense in the America in 1960s, but also just on a more visceral level that suffering being endured through the killing of these people is just, it's inhuman. Well, and so the, the the passage that Riley read, I mean, there's there's a good example of heroic humanity in in there, though. Like it's like the duty of affection, or something. I forget exactly. Yeah, it was the duty of affection, and so I set out like this this other this other framework where there's like a demonstration of heroism, but in a new way, where we have to really take people's value into consideration and act on it. And so like, there's this other frame of reference that's, that's just so clearly there that I know it's gonna get expanded on as we move forward, but I just wanted to like 
stress that passage or that that sentence in the in the passage it's like like the power of presence and what we can provide to each other and like this other thing that humans are able to do which has value which has been underrepresented i i just want to add that um i remember having a you know a conversation with my husband and i forget the exact language but it was something he said something like men want to distinguish themselves he he, he said something like this like you you have to like distinguish yourself from amongst other people and you have to like stand out and of course this is the way that like through military conquest and so forth and um heroism etc this is the way that that's that's the sort of way that you do it at this time and this other way that you're talking about randy this like being present and being you know compassionate does not have that kind of like social status thing going on right um and i'll just leave it at that maybe it, it should but it's just like in the sort of scheme of society and like rank and reputation, like sitting with someone and being compassionate isn't really, yeah, amongst the sort of titles, if you will, that people are, are lusting after. And Virginia Woolf makes this point as well in Three Guineas. Goodbye. Well, like it does have a place, but it's, it's, there's it's barred off by the priestly class right because like the like the tribe shaman like part of the role part of that archetypal you know entry into society of that of that set of ideas is the spiritual needs of a person and there tends to be a person who will sit with you and discuss or just be with you during certain kinds of moments and there is certainly a, a place in society carved out for that but it's definitely it's definitely limited in the number of seats there so uh, i right. could say more but I'm cool. just yeah thanks so like tribe would you say tribe shaman yeah, like the medicine man, right? And then fast forward to like the minister or the person who's standing in front of the group leading the spiritual activity. Like there's always that figure, but there's, a, you know, there's only so many people who can be on the stage. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks. Right. Like there's this one person or small group of people who get to be the ones in charge of spiritual support and so because of that it's taken away from like it's now not just everyone can do it or not just anyone can do it but that's simply not true and you know this passage does show that like it's a duty that anyone and everyone has um just to those around you, those you love, those who love you. It's just being there and being able to like bear witness to someone's pain or suffering is something that's really, really important. Um, but on the subject of loss further, um, a bit, just a bit after this, you know, scene happens. Martha is visiting her friend, Lori. And while she's there, Lori gets this letter and begins reading it. And she screams and drops it and begins to weep. And so Martha picks it up and reads it out loud. And um, it's a list of the dead. And near the beginning, it's um, one of Lori's brothers has died. And so she's there to like witness Lori finding out about this and she continues to read it and it says I recognized among the dead faces of so many dear friends and amongst others there is poor here I had to turn the page poor Arno Dotsky I fell unconscious on the floor um so here at the same time that Lori 
finds out that her brother has died. Martha's right there with her and finds out that her husband has died. And here this is like her personal experience coming face to face with the suffering of war of not just those who are on the battlefield and fighting and losing their lives as the like at home, those who don't get heard from so much, those who aren't considered like you don't write about them in the history books, right? Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it goes without saying like the dead soldiers don't often make the newspaper. Uh, I mean, the obituary section, sure, but we were talking a second ago about this idea about like status and being distinguished from a crowd. And like, for some reason, it's easy to forget the mound, like the whole pile of bodies upon which our heroes stand. And it's weird because it takes a book like this to pull the frame of reference into awareness. Like it's basically like, okay, we're, we're taking that heroic image of the victorious, con you know, conquest victor person. And we just zooming, we're just stepping back with the camera and we see all of the bodies of the, you know, the, the people who will be effectively forgotten after any, after a couple years right and yeah there's memorials and yeah there's plaques and yeah it's 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 a sacrifice and there's a lot of good things about sacrifice but at some point we have to recognize the brutality and so that's kind of there's such a shock there that martha is unconscious right and what other response is there it's oh you know the entire the entire frame of reference for the future that you had constructed is now gone. What next? Uh, and I, I don't think that I don't think that there's a better way to phrase it than, you know, immediately becoming unconscious. <laughs> so. Pause for thought. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And so she becomes unconscious, but then she begins to read even more. And so um, chapter three, the sections are years of widowhood, re-entry into society, introduction to Baron Tilling, and manner of my husband's death. So um, as Riley knows, because I've discussed this with her, chapter three is my favorite of all of these chapters. And um, she <laughs> mentions um, a new approach to history that Riley will talk about. She also mentions, and it will come up later in the book, Charles Darwin. Um, and so The Origin of Species is published in 1859. And so, right, it's kind of like a new theory when she's writing this book. And by the way, she's also mentioning Darwin in the book Das Maschine und Zeitalter, which is published just before Lay Down Your Arms. She was very much taken by the Darwin's theory of evolution. She mentions it. And she mentions this Thomas Buckles history of civilization. Um, she is 20 years old when she decides to read. And if I recall, she's really reading to educate her son, right? So the father has died, Arno Dotsky has died, and she's really reading to educate Rudolf Dotsky. And so, Riley, I'll turn it over to you to talk about some of these passages in chapter three. Yeah, um, I also wanted to add that, again, my version of the book does have different um, headings for these chapters. And I wanted to add that one of them in mine is solitude, study, and large views. And so this kind of plays into what we had talked about of the development intellectually that 
Martha has. And this is also one of my favorite chapters um, because it's it, it's almost like the idea of like uh, like the dark night of the soul kind of thing. Like she has this, she loses her husband and it's, she falls into this like pit of despair, but in that, in her solitude, she's able to learn more and like really begin to grow and really begin to like become human. Um, and so she, um, Beg, she finds her bookseller and begs him to send her um, some new historical work to look at. And so he sends, like Hope said, Thomas Buckle's History of Civilization, which is not finished yet at this time, but there's two volumes. And on page 47, she says, when I had read these two volumes and then read them again, I felt like a man who had dwelt all his life in the bottom of a narrow valley and then, for the first time, had been taken up to one of the mountain tops around, from which a long stretch of country was to be seen, covered with buildings and gardens and ending in the boundless ocean. Which, I love this quote for a couple reasons. Um, the first being, she reads the two volumes and then reads them again, which is something that Hope has talked about a lot. <laughs> um, and that's that's so important is you know you don't it's like really becoming familiar with something really beginning to understand it you have to read it more than once and she just does that on her own without being told to and then it's she describes this feeling like almost of enlightenment like for the first time being taken up to a mountaintop and really seeing all there is to see around her um and it, it's almost like she's she's explaining, you know, a feeling of waking up um, to reality. Um, if anyone has anything to say, go ahead. If not, I'm going to continue to more of what she says about this book. Uh, I mean, just a brief comment, not to drag this too far away, but your your choice in words there was precise. Um, there's a there's a cognitive scientist named John Verveke who provides a really nice operational definition of enlightenment, which has everything to do with this passage. This this it's a uh, roughly speaking a way of breaking frame and seeing the world with fresh eyes um, from a higher vantage point fundamentally. And so, yeah, the metaphor in the book uh, captures the idea perfectly. That's all. Thank you. Um, so as she continues to describe her experience reading Thomas Buckle's book, she says on page 48, he lays stress on the fact that as society progresses, not only war itself, but the love of war will be found to diminish. That word spoke to my innermost heart. Even in my short spiritual experience, this diminution had been going on and though I had, often sorry, I had often repressed this movement as something cowardly or unworthy, believing that I alone was the cause of such a fault within me, now, on the contrary, I perceived that this feeling in me was only the faint echo of the spirit of the age, that learned men and thinkers, like this English historian and innumerable men along with him, had lost the old idolatry for war, which, just as it had been a phase of my childhood, was represented in this book as being also a phase of the childhood of society. And so, in Buckle's History of Civilization, I had found just the opposite of what I sought, and yet I counted what I found as all pure gain. I felt myself elevated by it, enlightened, pacified. Once I tried to talk with my father about this point of view that I had just attained, but in vain. He would not follow me up the mountain, i.e. he would not read the book, and so it was to no purpose to talk with him of things which one could only see from the top of it. Um, there's a lot going on here, it's kind of a long passage, but first, it's really important that she 
the feeling she had been having about, you know, as we've been talking about this whole time, thinking about the, you know, human side of war and this suffering and problems with it, she, in her military circle around her, because that's all the people she knows, she doesn't encounter this perspective, like, at all in her daily life. And so she feels really alone and like maybe there's something wrong with her for thinking this, but then when she reads this book, she finds that, you know, the, she says learned men and thinkers, like the people who are growing intellectually and considering these things are feeling the same way that she is. And yeah, I think that just that part is really, really important to acknowledge that this in, her continuing to read and her learning, she doesn't find what she was looking for, but it's even better than what she thought she was going to find. And then also that her father, who again represents this, you know, the childhood of society idea of idolizing war and seeing it as not just a necessary thing, but a good thing. Um, there's no point in talking to him about it because he won't read the book and you know she continues the metaphor of you know she felt like a man who was finally brought up to the top of a mountain and could see you know the whole the world around her and the vast ocean you know it's not going to make sense talking about that's not going to make sense to anyone who hasn't also gone up the mountain they'll have no idea what you're talking about and this is again kind of like you know, different stories we hear about enlightenment and stuff. Like, you know, you can't explain enlightenment to someone who hasn't also experienced it. Um, yeah. Well, it's it's worse, right? Because, you know, this goes all the way back to, you know, Plato in the cave, right? It's not It's not only that you can't explain it. It's that if you come back and start to try to explain it, you're now threatening the reality of the people who are in that space you're you're a threat to their entire way of being because you know you're presenting this new frame of reference and it forces them to change and why why would you allow such a thing to exist you're you know you're because you're you're effectively like shaking the pillars upon which an entire life is built and people don't like when you you know, poke their, uh, poke their axioms, right? It's like their, their fundamental frames of reference. And so it's one thing when you discover that on your own, and it's another when somebody's trying to push it in your face, right? That's all. I was just going to add to that. There's a reason why so many people hated Socrates. Yeah. I mean, it, in, he ended up being the kind of figure who transforms civilization that we remember for 2,500 years. But yeah, people at the time don't particularly like them and, or didn't particularly like him. He, he had to eat, you know, Hemlock took him down pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like you were saying, it people don't like you can't change someone's view, especially when it's something that's so central to what they think is good, it's central to their core values, and mm -hmm. it will shake that, and you know, it'll have to flip everything they think on its head, and it, it's almost like you can't bring, like you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Like, you know, you can express your ideas to someone, but you can't make them understand it or even try to understand it. You can well, and a book, but you can't make them read it. Well, there's technical reasons for this too, right? So like in, you know, in neuroscience, you have like, you have reasonably overwhelming amount of information indicating that like half of our brain is responsible for exploring and taking in new information. And then the other half is basically for categorizing and organizing what we've got. And people live in the categorizing side almost all of the time. And so like the part of us that's doing most of our cognitive activity doesn't want things to change radically. It's the other part that's hidden away and our whole societal structures seem to be basically, you know, 
in some ways constructed explicitly to prevent the exploratory side of our consciousness from emerging at all. Why? It's it threatens everything. So you know, it, it that that's a truism of society and of the individual, right? All the way down at the at the level of like physiology, our being does not want new information pushed on us. But if we discover it on our own, then the mechanism for breaking frame and transforming is available. Otherwise, you don't want somebody to inf- impose a new frame on you, right? Because that implies that you've been doing something wrong. It implies you have a lot to change. It implies that you don't know where you are. And if you don't know where you are, you're in trouble, right? Your life is in danger. And so people don't want to feel that way. And it's definitely appropriate most of the time. The problem is that there's this it's exaptation, right? It's a it's a adaptive strategy that gets taken into a new domain. And sometimes that new domain is super useful, and then sometimes it's pathological. And in this case, it's we're, we're observing a place where it's pathological. Um, if I may, <laughs> um, so like this passage. Right. She like felt that she was alone and she had something wrong with her. Um, Right. Uh, I felt that I had a fault within me and I had often repressed this as something cowardly or unworthy. And yeah, like you said, Riley, she's alone and she's alone because she can't talk to her father also um and i think that like beneath like axioms and intellectual principles and this kind of thing um there are needs psychological needs and i think that what's going on here if i may is it's like the psychological need to belong, which the Corps de Brazza Foundation is sort of like built on the recognition of that need and the pathological ways in which it is, quote, satisfied. But clearly her father, like, has a sense of belonging. He's like, like you said, Randy, like, like this is his reality. And I, I just want to, you know, as you, as you say, Randy, put a different frame on it, um, that this is like he's attached to it because this is like satisfying his need to belong and and safety and and things like this and and martha reads buckle and this is like a, a metaphysical thing that's happening when she's encountering buckle this is what i would call a genuine encounter and it's it's a transnational and transgenerational fellowship right that there's like there's an encounter and there's a transference of moral energy. There's something going on between Buckle and Martha and she feels belonging. Like she feels like this is like a community and she feels at home and safe. And the irreconcilability between her and her father is that they're feeling this belonging and safety from different sources. I, it's just, it's like, it's what, it's what you're saying. I'm just putting like a different vocab on it. And, um, and I think that, yeah, the need to belong and figuring out ways to do that, that don't harm ourselves and other people is uh, something that we all have to work on to quote, find peace, period. Yeah, I mean, and so the whole structure that's being built for peace to live on top of is a worldview that bri- that bridges the gap between the culture of war that's been the default for at least a certain stratum of society for as long as we have had written history and this other island of intellectuals and whoever else who seem to be trying to understand the wider scope of human progression and recognize that, well, 
eventually the bombs are going to get so big that they kill everybody. So one day or another, it's going to have to stop. So like logically, there has to be some kind of big change in the way people approach their world and what values reign supreme. Like stepping into that and bridging that gap is the process of building peace. That's what that's what it is. It's it just it takes a long time. It doesn't just happen because a couple people don't want war anymore and that's why i think we spend so much time talking about both bertha von sutner in this book but the peace movement generally i mean that's what's going on elihu root says it in that speech that he doesn't end up getting to give his nobel acceptance speech that gets uh undone right it's like it takes centuries for civilization to change their brutish nature I forget the exact quote now, but it's like people like Elihu Root can see the big frame, even though he was the secretary of war. It's like he's a dude who's trying to play the long game, moving humanity towards a better future. Right on. Is this pause for thought? Um, yeah, so we're coming. Yeah, we're we're almost like at at ninety minutes, and um, she she like reads and she has this this new new sense of belonging. I'll put it that way, and she has like a community, if you will with Buckle and then she learns that, oh my goodness, Baron Frederick Don Tilling is also in that community. Um, although he is a soldier as well. And so, as we said, um, <clears throat> in this section, she's introduced to Baron Von Tilling. She meets him and he is the one who explains to her how her first husband died. Um, he was there. And so, Riley, would you like to take it over from here? Yes, I would. Okay. Um, this kind of harkens back to um, when Martha tried to go see Frau von Ullmann um, just to weep with her, basically. Um, out of a sense of duty and Frederick von Tilling had been fighting alongside Arno Dotsky and saw the way he died and felt this need of duty to go explain to Martha how he died to kind of settle some of her worries because um, you know fortunately he was killed like on impact of a shell like he didn't lay and suffer like you know, a bomb came and he died immediately. And, you know, um, and something important about this too, um, Frederick says to her, um, I will not repeat to you the empty phrase with which the survivors of soldiers are usually comforted. He died like a hero, for I do not quite know what that means. And that's something I think is important because he's not trying to like tell her she shouldn't be sad because he died like a hero or you know he had a hero's death or whatever like he doesn't know what that means like it, it doesn't mean anything really he's just there to tell her what ha happened um and he continues to say men who have the warrior spirit are seized in the midst of the powder fog and bullet rain with such an intoxication that they do not know exactly what is going on dotsky was a man of this kind his eyes sparkled he laid about him with a firm hand. He was in the full intoxication of war. I, who was sober, could see it. Um, and, and that too, that phrase there kind of gives Martha this hint that maybe Frederick von Tilling is someone who abhors war as well, um, even though he's a soldier. And that kind of shakes 
a frame for her that like there could be a soldier who you know doesn't like war <laughs> um and something else about this interaction just kind of a little bit off topic that i do really enjoy is just part of this chapter begins um just what i think is a really excellent love story too just in the middle of all of this in the midst of all of the sadness and suffering i think it's just it's beautifully written and it's something that i was like enjoying reading <laughs> i guess yeah thanks for that anybody so that sort of like takes us to um yeah the the end of chapter three so she she learns about how Arno Dotsky dies and she meets uh, Tilling and um, yes, the chapters that follow are the sort of dance between the two. <laughs> um, but um, I think that yeah concludes the discussion of, of the first three chapters and as as we always do. Um, we'll just go around and see if we have any any summary thoughts if not that's fine um and so michael i'll start with you any final thoughts or or not yeah one thing that has kind of been percolating in my mind throughout the whole conversation is that i think what just makes for me personally bertha's work and all for activism so prevalent is that you can truly go through this red thread draw a point from where she was in her point in time in writing this book to where we are today in 2021 and when randy was talking and saying you know that this brutish nature of like killing and these wars and the sheer glorification of it really seems to culminate itself in World War II, you know, you have the Great War, which occurs just very shortly after Bertha dies, and you think, oh, that's the worst it can get. It, it was, you know, the moniker, the war to end all wars. It really can't get worse than this. But then it does, and then all the brutality and just sheer devastation that resulted from that really seems to serve of, okay, is this the event? And then you have the two nuclear bombings. And so, as Randy said, they, the bombs can get so big to the point where it will annihilate all human life on earth. So it's like, that's the point where you're at. And so do we continue to engage in this brutish behavior or do we seek a different path? And I think the first democratically elected mayor of Hiroshima after the atomic bombing, Shinzo Hamai, says it best in his mayoral declaration of Hiroshima as a peace city after his election, that this process, these bombings, this whole arc that we have endured through this war marks a revolution of thought. And so laying the groundwork through individuals like Bertha and the slow percolation of these ideas and having these two horrid atrocities in the two world wars that occur to really in some way hopefully shock humanity and realizing we really can't continue to do this on this scale and obviously throughout the rest of the 20th century and, and even into the 21st there have been these conflicts and still working towards resolving disputes not through violence is still a process we are engaging in today, but from that exists these international frameworks through which individuals and nation states hopefully engage in to end that. And so it seems we're in a new period maybe where that old past is still very much the shadow close to us, but you can sort of see where it can go from here in a way in which you're interacting with others around the world that is not in the way that it was traditionally done through armed conflicts. So hopefully to a better future bound for all of humanity, but so much work to be done. And I think Bertha's work in all for activism serves as a great touching point to one, educate yourself on the movement, but then two, see the projection in which things have played out from her time into ours.
And so, and to just end, Riley, it was so awesome getting to have you on Virtues of Peace. Amazing job facilitation, facilitating and seriously, so much more food for thought as I continue on in my own personal growth and development. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate that. I am very grateful to have been allowed on the show. Um, something I wanted to say as well, just as my concluding remark, is that, um, you know, this is a slow change um, towards war becoming less common. And Randy had mentioned at the beginning of the episode how, you know, Bertha von Suttner actually did die. Um, I believe it was exactly seven days before the assassination of the Archduke, which kind of set off World War One. And there's this worry that like, man, she lived her whole life being a peace activist, and then like the worst war that had happened up to that point happened right after she died. Like, are we really going in the right direction? But what I think is encouraging and so important is that we're talking about the book right now. Like it doesn't matter that she died and then things kept getting worse. Like right now, we're still using her work to move forward. And yeah, that's all I'll say. Thank you for having me today. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll say something here as, as well. Um, you know, I, I want to give credit where credit is due. And it's like, the the idea that war is heroic and important it's not like it's coming from nowhere right like it comes from somewhere uh, back in you know back in our ancient days we needed initiation rituals in order to establish young people as part of the community and one of the things that's always present in those is a willingness to endure enormous amounts of pain and the threat or you know severe like serious possibility of death that a person needed to volunteer for which i mean that that's that's just part and parcel of initiation rituals and the whole point of it is if you're willing to suffer and potentially die for the community then you're willing to go to the appropriate lengths to contribute to the community and therefore you get you know, the accolade of membership, right? So that's like not a new thing. That's an old thing. And it's a very important thing. Like it's not trivial, but the world is a little different than it used to be. Then, you know, we're not living on the Savannah anymore, right? So the initiation ritual hasn't evolved yet to the point where it can replace the ancient need for community building. And so it took this shift in technological power for us to start to realize it at a national scale or at a civilization scale where like the nuclear weapons were like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We actually might not survive this at all. Like none of us, not our group, not their group, nobody. And so like the idea of the peace movement bursts on the scene during the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. And suddenly like the idea of peace gets thrown in everybody's face as a response to the enormous technological advancements that force us to take this stuff into consideration a little more carefully. So we're not like, we're not, we're still in one generation of people who are exposed to this different frame of reference. Right. And there's been like, it's, it's one person ago that this all took place. Like my grandfather was in world war II. He's still alive. This man's 96 years old. He was, he was there. <laughs> and so like, it takes time for these things to change at a deep cultural level because they're coming from a deep place right it's like the the social world is, a, is an enormous part of our lives and the willingness to sacrifice yourself is a necessary component to that so it's not all brutality it's not all thirst for blood that's motivating 
the like the other side so to speak but we all at this point can see that there's a logical impossibility to war continuing deep into the future so yeah we're building the structures upon which that future peace can thrive thanks for that i'm i have so many thoughts in my head and i'm just like nodding <laughs> i'm just nodding to everything that i'm hearing and and um this what, what worries me is um this like the sense of alarm that you're talking about like we can destroy every like I just when I when I read this stuff from before World War One and I read Bertha and other people, it's that same sense of alarm. And so like the barbarization of the sky, as we mentioned earlier today, she's just like, do not like do not move warfare. Like don't don't make the sky a theater of war. Just don't go there. Just like hands off. And of course, that didn't happen. And as she points out, people realized that and at the Hague conference they sort of like signed a, a declaration that they they wouldn't drop explosives from the sky but they did anyway and so you know what's concerning is the sort of like it's almost like desensitization right that things get, are so horrible and then we just accept it well it's just it's just the way it is we're just going to like kill we're just going to kill humanity and there's a kind of, yeah, like desensitization and detachment that, um, yeah, that is concerning to me. Um, and I'll close by just read, like, like once again, this 1906 piece that's on our show resources page from which I have been reading throughout this show. It's just four pages. It's really awesome. I highly recommend. Um, and so in this section, she is just sort of like, wow, I mean, the reception of lay down your arms is like out of control and, and people are just responding to my Austrian Peace Society and like, like people like this is how people are thinking people want this. And there's all this support. And so she's quoting an editorial. This is if you happen to download it, it's on page 251 of this article. Um, so then followed this editorial comment on the idea, quote, because of the new instruments of destruction and the increased armed forces, war has been changed into a thing that ought to be described by another name. Because of the continuous development and warlike preparations, armies are now quite different from what they were when we last saw them brought face to face. Let me illustrate my meaning. If you keep on warming a bath till the water boils so that the person who steps in rather falls into the tub is scalded to death, can you still call this a bath? I mean, so this is 1906. And you know what this is saying is, dudes it's so like horrible now it's not even and like it's so changing now that it's not even yeah a war and so i read that from 1906 and it's just like i don't know i think there's a process of desensitization um that i find concerning and alarming and so um i think we say good night now <laughs> and that we will be back maybe with the next three chapters. Um, yeah, so Riley did a really beautiful job and um, you were not allowed to come on. We welcomed and honored to have your presence with us and to teach us. So thank you for teaching us. And um, hopefully we'll come back in a couple of weeks for the next three or so chapters. And you have been listening to Virtues of Peace. And again, check out our show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com. And again, tomorrow is POWMIA Recognition Day. And so if you don't know what that is, check it out. We also have a website, dutytoremember.com. 
All right. That's all for today. Bye-bye.